What's up guys, it's Dull Matter here, and today we're going to be re reacting to a Chris Williamson video, What Happens If Women Start Dating Down. Um, this is more of a breakdown because I've already actually watched this, it just came out earlier today. And I was watching it, and I thought it was kind of ridiculous some of the stuff that the guest is saying, because he contradicts himself rather quickly, so uh, let's get into it and break it down. Is hypergamy on the decline? So there is some evidence uh, for this. Um... It, which I think is kind of inevitable. So hypergamy is women's tendencies to mate uh, with an equal or higher status kind of mate. And uh, I think it's inevitable as more and more women become highly educated and uh, killing it in the workplace that they will begin to have to mate down. And uh, some, some evolutionary kind of based scholars disagree with me on the fact that there is a mating crisis at all. And they point to some of this evidence as ev I think, first of all, right off the bat, right? The idea that there's no mating crisis at all is just absolutely ridiculous, right? If you look at the birth rate in the West, it's been below replacement rate now for five decades. The only reason we have an increase in population over the last five decades is because we have massive amounts of immigration, right? If you take out that immigration, most of the, the Western countries' population would have declined anywhere from 20 to 30 percent in the last 50 years. Um, but we have population increase because of the massive amounts of immigration. Like, I, I live in Canada. When I was born, there was roughly 30 million people. Now there's just shy of 40 million people, despite the fact that we have not had a replacement rate birth rate that entire time. Um, all of that extra immigration, or all of that extra population is just solely from immigration, from the country taking, you know, I, I believe Canada targets somewhere around 1% to 2% population growth annually from immigration. Um you know, the, the idea that there's no mating crisis is just absolutely fucking ludicrous. It's undeniable that there's, there's one in the Western countries, at least. Evidence that there is no mating crisis, nothing to worry about. But even the authors of that study that showed that hypergamy is in decline said that they can't speak to the perceived difficulty for women in finding mates that they have to mate down with. Uh, so it doesn't appear that women are actually that what, happy. What does that mean? So the, the, it, it doesn't appear that women are actually that happy about having to mate down. So uh, there's some evidence for this that uh, female infidelity is kind of on the rise in lockstep with hypergamy. So, And that right there is what disproves it, right? Because I think the problem is this guy thinks of hypergamy solely as like who you're dating or who you're married to. And the problem is that's not like he's misunderstanding it, right? It's. Um, one of the common sayings you hear in like the MGTOW fucking red pill, like these different communities, the manosphere in general is alpha fucks, beta bucks, right? A lot of these girls will get knocked up by a, a dude that they can't actually fucking latch down, right? They'll have a kid with him and then they'll go find some other guy to be the provider or at least a partial provider, right? In order to help provide. So what you see, like, again, he's even admitting to it right here is that they're still engaging in hypergamous behavior, right? They're just willing to you know, settle down with the beta. A lot of them are become less delusional about the fact that they're not going to marry the, like, you know, alpha dude, right? They're not going to marry the guy that's worth, like, $100 million. They're, you know, maybe they can get knocked up by him, right? They can be one of Nick Cannon's or Elon Musk's baby mamas, right? Both of them have, I think Nick's has, like, fucking 14 kids or something. Elon, I think, just had his 10th kid. Um, but then these women will go and they'll marry another dude, and then half the time they'll cheat on that dude anyway, right? So hypergamy is still happening, and he disproves like he disproves his first statement with that second statement. As hypergamy is in decline, female infidelity, not male, uh, goes up. Male infidelity has remained pretty stable over the last 50 or so years, but female infidelity has increased by 40% over the last half century. And... Uh, Perhaps that's uh, just an artifact of them occupying more high-status positions, being around more high-status men, maybe increased anonymity with dating apps and things like that. Lower um, partner satisfaction as well, probably. Yeah. I think lower partner satisfaction is probably the biggest contributor. But then on top of that, you have like the decline in religiosity, right? So, you know, back in the day, people literally had the fear of God, or you had the fear of burning in hell for eternity if you committed different sins, right? So people would attempt not to do them. Nowadays, you have girls that, like, claim to be religious, right? Like, oh, I'm a Christian. She'll have, like, a fucking... She'll wear a little cross necklace. She'll have a little cross tattoo. Her favorite Bible verse is tattooed on her. She'll have it in her fucking Instagram profile. But everything is fucking ass pics. And she's at the club every fucking weekend, sleeping with three different dudes a week, right? So they don't actually believe in these religions they claim to, right? They just say they do because... 
Um, oh, I'm spiritual, right? Or they don't want to piss off their grandparents. That's what a lot of it is, right? Um, but I, I think it's two factors. One, I think, is undeniably the rise, uh, you know, the, basically the um, the destruction of, like, the traditional systems for how stuff should be, right? When, when it comes to, like, how male and female dynamics, right? And the, the movement of women into the workforce. And then secondarily, I think a lot of it has to do with the decline in religiosity, and the, and the social acceptance of, um, you know, extramarital sex, extramarital affairs. Um, you know, like nowadays you have like these major news corporations like MSNBC, CNN, um, you know, some of the more like I wouldn't even really call them major news corporations. They're more like lifestyle cosmetology type shit like Slate and Vogue and all this shit. And they come out talking about like polyamorous relationships and fucking – um, you know, cuckoldry and all of this stuff as if it's, like, the new lifestyle norm. And one of the things I find funny about this especially is, like, the they always view polyamorous as, like, a good thing for the woman but, like, a bad thing for the man, right? So you'll have these same magazines talk about, like, how polygamy is bad, right? Like, these, you know, traditional religious concepts where, like, a man has, you know, multiple wives, which certain religions have, right? Like, certain branches of Mormonism, certain branches of Christianity, um, Islam, right? A lot of these, you know, religions traditionally... It was okay for the man to have multiple wives as long as he could afford it. Um, but th they'll say that's like the worst thing ever. It's horrible. It's sexist. It's disgusting. It's misogynistic. And then they'll turn around and talk about like why you should have three boyfriends, right? And it's, <laughs> oh, it'll help with the kids. Oh, you'll have more finances in your house, right? It's like, it's, it's kind of funny because like literally what they cite as like the benefits of it are like, shit that like an evolutionary biologist would say women look for in men right so instead of getting one high status man they're just getting three like super beta dudes to you know basically they all add up to that one high status man uh, no longer reliant uh, on uh, you know uh, no longer having to worry about what would happen if they did get divorced uh, another uh, troubling finding from this um, consequence of the decline in hypergamy is that a recent study of 21,000 women in 27 EU countries found that women who were higher educated or earning more than their partners were more likely to report all types of intimate partner violence. And that makes sense from an evolutionary point of view because men are most likely to kind of inflict costs on their partner when they feel like they might be about to lose them. So if their partner is earning more than them and is around more high status men, they're getting that cue and, and they'll, they'll maybe shift to, because when you don't have much benefit to provide, you change to a cost inflicting uh, mate retention strategy. So that might be what's happening there. So it's not like, oh, hypergamy is in decline. That's nothing to worry about. You know, there's downstream consequences of this. And, uh, you know, the mating crisis overall has uh, broader con uh, consequences too, because uh, you might have heard of something called young male syndrome, Chris. Have you heard of that? That's the proliferation of childless, partnerless men roaming the streets in gangs and graffitiing everywhere and kicking grannies and stuff. Right. So this is actually something I've talked about before in a few videos, right? One of the biggest predictors of violence is lack of access to women and men. And there was a great book, again, I've cited this book a couple times on here, uh, Sex and Culture by J.D. Unwin. And he wrote this book back in the 1930s, but if you read it, it reads like a reactionary work to the 1960s and 1970s sexual revolution. And basically what he talks about is he, he compares polygamous societies, polyamorous societies, um, fucking uh, monogamous societies. Uh, like basically he just co compares like a bunch of societies. I think there's like 270, 272, something like that, societies that he compares throughout history. And he compares them at like, you know, their ascension, their peak, and then their decline. And like the sexual views and sexual morals of the society as it r rises and eventually falls and basically you know what he says is like when a, when a society is on its upward trajectory and when it's at its peak they tend to be highly monogamous right and you can see this in you know britain which hit its peak in the victorian and the edwardian era was very much a monogamous society they were hyper religious right if you look at like queen victoria she one of the most amazing rulers ever in my opinion as far as like anglo rulers go um, so traditionally, the kings would always get a, a portrait done, right? And the portrait would always was meant to show power and prestige. So they would show them as like larger than life, and they're like big, and they're standing up with their shoulders like broadened out, usually with like a weapon or something. Um, and it was to show like how dominating the king is, how powerful the king is, right? Like traditional masculine values. 
And then what she did is they want – her portrait makers actually wanted her to basically do the same thing. And she said, no, we shouldn't be doing that. What she did is she had her sitting on the throne with her husband standing beside her with his hand on her shoulder. And then all of her kids, because she had like something like eight kids or something, they were all running around playing. And her, her goal was to make herself look like this like great matriarch that way, because people look up to the royals, right? Especially back in those times when they had a lot more power. And they look up to them as basically like the highest status symbol in the land. This is what you want to achieve towards, right? So if you have these very masculine men and these very feminine women that are taking this motherhood role, that's you know, seen as, like, this highest virtue and, like, this, you know, concept of monogamy and this concept of the feminine woman. And you saw the rise of Britain largely through her, right? Britain reached its peak under her and then her son and then a little bit of her grandson. And a lot of this has to do with, like, the, the skyrocketing birth rate under her because this was seen as, like, the absolute pinnacle of what you could, you know, desire as a person. And then you, you kind of saw a similar thing in the 1950s in America, right? When America was... <clears throat> you know, people tend to look back at, it, back at it as like kind of the golden age of the United States, right? 1950s Americana is often looked back at as like this, you know, leave it to beaver, white picket fences. You know, you had the, you know, the woman in the home, the man was earning good money that he could support three, four, five kids. Um, you know, basically the, you know, the, the later boomers, right? The mid to late boomer years or when they were being born. Um, and a lot of people view that as like the pinnacle of the United States and they had a very similar, uh, you know, a very similar structural system, although they had no queen really enforcing it. A lot of it was just down to the way that, you know, the societal views were thanks to religion. But then you hit the 60s and the 70s, and then all of a sudden you have this, you know, the sexual revolution and sexual freedom and all of this stuff. You have a spike in violent crime. Um, and you, you'll often see people talk about how, you know, violent crime has been on the decline for like three or four decades, but they always start at the 70s. And there's a reason they always start at the 70s. That's because there was a huge fucking spike in the 60s and 70s. And prior to that... Violent crime was, compared to today's levels, basically non-existent, right? It's it's kind of funny when you read those – like when you look at those studies because they always choose the same starting year. And there's a reason for that so they can skew the data in a certain direction. Right. So if you have a surplus population of unpartnered young men in any society, cross-culturally, cross-historically, they've always been extremely disruptive. And, you know, due to elevated risk-taking and status-driving kind of behaviors. Um, so, you know, that, that – this kind of mating crisis is dangerous on a bigger level because that's uh, what we're leaning towards. And actually, you know, we would actually, although there is a level of threat from incel violence, uh, I feel like it's over uh, overemphasized in the media and a bit alarmist. Uh, but theoretically, we should expect that incels represent a very dangerous portion of society. But what might be happening there is that their status driving mechanisms are maybe hijacked just by online worlds. And their status driving in forums or shit posting on the internet and getting kind of counterfeit fitness cues from pornography that you're an evolutionary success if you stay at home jerking off to uh, the stimulus the stimulus of uh, the sex on the screen that's a, an idea put forward in a and yeah that kind of links into uh jd unwin's book again as well um to some degree although with him it was more about promiscuity right um and that because you know as promiscuity becomes more common uh, you know, men have to achieve less in order to get the same results, right? So they tend to achieve less. Um, but also, I, I, you know, I made a video about pornography, fuck, it'd be like two, three days ago now. Um, and I, I think it's undeniably true, right? You, you look at like most men, and the, I know a lot of dudes that are basically like coomers, right? They sit in their fucking room and they just jerk off all day and then they have no ambition to do anything, right? And that's because the reason that you have ambition in the first place is to attempt to acquire a mate, right? It's either to get access to food, which is super easy nowadays, right? You can be fucking broke. You can you can literally be a bum. You can go panhandle for 20 minutes and you can afford a week's worth of food, right? Um, you can be basically making nothing and have access to food. Um, and then when, with access to sex, you basically have like these stimulants online, right? The stimulation through uh, pornography, which is basically just like cuckoldry, right? If you think about it, like you're watching a man have sex with a woman, unless you're watching lesbian porn, then I guess technically it's not. But, you know, any heterosexual sex on the internet is basically just cuckoldry, right? Um, and you have these men who are basically just beating it all day and then they have no desire or drive to do anything be after that because they've already got the sexual stimulation that they need, right? They don't have to strive for anything. A great article by Diana Fleischman called Uncanny Vulvas. Uh, a play on, on, on the uncanny valley. Uh, it, it's a really good read. Yeah, so what you're saying is that the young male syndrome, which is this uh, phenomenon where lots of 
men without partners tends to be destabilizing for society could perhaps be being dampened down by online status, by porn, all of these things that are kind of simulacrums of cues that they would have previously been super aggressive about, but they're kind of being sedated into uh, a more uh, dom yeah. domicile version of this, right? Yeah, it's like a pacifier, yes. pacifying effect that... Uh, but yeah, yeah, you mentioned there. Uh, the I think another factor is like men tend to, you know, they, they climb social hierarchies just by nature, right? But a lot of the time they climb social hierarchies that no one cares about. Like I love playing video games, but like the amount of dudes I know um, that will like grind for like weeks on end in order to get like a fucking, you know, whatever the highest rank is in whatever video game they are, right? So like Champ Division in Fortnite or... Um, you know, Onyx and Halo, or I think Diamond's the highest in Rocket League, or no, no, it's Grand Champ, isn't it? I don't fucking know. But they'll, tr they'll, they'll grind for weeks on end in order to get this. And they get social status out of it, but the problem is th the the pool of women that they're competing for is, like, incredibly small, right? Like, if you look at, like, the male-to-female ratio in video games, it is starting to move over, right? There are starting to be more females moving into the space, especially over the last, like, I would say 10 years or so, right? Like, when I was, when I came into high school, Video games were something that, like, you could literally be socially ostracized for. Like, it's like, oh, this dude plays video games? What a fucking dork. And then I would say, like, about mid-high school, like, like literally within that, like, five-year period, right? It went from, like, something you'd be socially ostracized for to something that, you know, you... It, depending on who you are, you might get a pass to... You could literally be cool off of it, right? Like, if you were really good at video games, you could be considered cool. And you, you're kind of starting to see that, but it's still, you know, there's... That, that's mostly for younger people. That's really not for anyone like in their, you know, late twenties and on, right? I'd say that's not very true. Uh, so you see men competing in a lot of these dominance hierarchies where there's really no, you know, there's, there's no end goal other than the do like the you know being on the top of the hierarchy itself. Maybe you know you can make like a su uh, successful YouTuber Twitch career out of it if you're really fucking good or really charismatic or really funny or something. But a lot of the time, you know, the people that are, like, especially when it comes to, like, the, well, I mean, really with any of those, right? Because you either have to be dedicated, incredibly intelligent, um, you know, charismatic, funny, right? These are all qualities that, like, would carry over to any other dominance hierarchy, largely. Um, but because of, like, the lack of women in these fields, like, on average, you know, the, the, there's a massive amount of men competing for a tiny amount of women that are actually into these things, right? Because so many more women are trying to go into like career spaces right so it's like you know you come you know you're like a fucking uh you know like some top level phd and, and then your boyfriend's like fucking you know grand champ on rocket league it's, it's like, like one of these things doesn't add up to the other right you know what i mean you uh, you had uh, joe henrik on the podcast before right indeed yeah so he, he wrote a great paper called the puzzle of monogamous marriage and he talks about how uh, cultures that began to practice monogamy flourished more than those that stuck with polygyny, which 83% of human societies that there ever has been or have ever been studied have been preferentially polygynous. And uh, I want to read that paper because that sounds like it overlaps a lot with what J.D. Unwin said. I'm actually really surprised J.D. Unwin is not more uh, popular and famous within, I mean, both like the, the Christian conservative movement because a lot of the stuff he says aligns with them. Um, maybe it's because he's atheistic. That's probably why. Um, you know, some of the stuff he said like aligns with the Christian conservative movement. Some of the stuff he says aligns with like the general manosphere stuff. Um, so I'm actually surprised he's not as pop, like not more popular. Like you go on like his Wikipedia, it's it's like three fucking lines on the guy. You try to find his book if you want like a physical copy. It, depending on like how many are available on Amazon at the time, they can cost like a thousand fucking dollars, and it's hard to find to download it. Like even. I mean, I guess now it would probably be in Creative Commons, uh, so it wouldn't even be an illegal download. But it, but it's hard to f even find that fucking book online, despite the fact that it's probably, like, if, for, like, current societal issues, it's probably one of, if not the most important book ever written. Joe Henrik talks about it as in monogamy's main cultural advantage is the egalitarian distribution of women. And that, that's a lot of listeners might get, uh, get mad at me talking about women as a, a resource, but they're a reproductive sexual resource. Reprodu and, it's sexual right. distribution strategy, man. Like if, if man that, that's one thing I always find funny, right, when you talk about this shit. Um, 
people get so mad at like the evolutionary reasons for like all of this stuff and like when you view humans as resources right like men tend to be like labor resources uh women tend to be reproductive resources and people get like really mad when you talk about that's like i'm human i have feelings i have emotions like yeah and all those have evolutionary reasons too right like people like try to they, they separate themselves almost and try and live in like this fairy tale universe um and not in, like a good fairy tale universe either but like in this kind of like like really like they separate themselves from nature i guess is the best way to put it and they try to view themselves as like separate from nature and like oh we're humans we're not animalistic despite the fact that we are animals all of our tendencies you know we're very intelligent animals but all of our tendencies are a lot of them the majority of them are because we're animals right yeah we we've made these massive civilizations but we've done that just like birds build nests right it's for the benefit of our offspring uh, it's, you know, in order to ensure the best reproductive chance for them and for their genes to carry on and so forth, right? That's the entire reason for empires. People people try to view it as, like, this, I don't even know, like, just this weird, like, th unique thing that only humans do. But, like, all animals are territorial, especially all predators, um, which we are. We're the apex predator of the world at this point, right? Of course, we're, like, highly territorial. Um, we're highly aggressive towards other uh, both species and others within our own species if they're not part of our clan or our tribe or our nation or whatever. Um, and a lot of this, you know, again, it just has to do with resource acquisition and, you know, mating rights, essentially. But people don't want to look at it that way because they, you know, they get, all, like, all butt hurt when you look at shit through, like, an actual biological lens because, it, you know, it makes... They, they, they say it makes... It's, you know, it's dehumanizing. It's inhuman. It's, like... I mean, no, it's it, it's very humanizing, right? You're looking at this objectively instead of through some, like, fairy tale pie-in-the-sky fucking Disney movie. Man number one gets woman number one to number ten, and then man number two takes woman number eleven to twenty. After a while, you can see how you capture a lot of the market, where if it's one-to-one, two-to-two, three-to-three, four-to-four, all the way along. It and this is actually one of... There is a book. I can't remember what it was called. Um, it actually might have been a paper. But it was written about like how is Islam, um, you're, you're allowed multiple wives assuming you can afford them, right? And obviously there's a lot of like really rich oil barons in the Muslim world, right? And what you see is a lot of those guys have, you know, s multiple wives, sometimes like 10, 20 wives. And you what you have is, in, you know, in the Islamic world, it actually has the most, uh, th the largest amount of single males without an availability of uh, possible, pros like, you know, potential partners um and you see that like that's for the last two three decades it's been the most violent place on earth right and there's a big reason for that and there's also there was a study that compared uh you know uh more tribal parts of africa to more christian parts of africa and it showed that like the more christian parts of africa because they believe in this monogamous relationship system tend to be a lot less violent than the more tribal parts where they have these more um you know traditional uh, kind of polygamous relationships where they have a bunch of men or a bunch of women with one man uh, and then you have all these men that have no access to mates and then they tend to, you know, they'll go out and search for them and they'll try to kill people and they'll fucking great people and all this other shit, right? Because so much of it, it like, you know, what's, what's that Maslow's hierarchy of needs, right? Like if you, uh, you know, if you have no access to like any chance of reproduction, what do you have to lose, right? It, it, it kind of makes sense. It keeps yep. more people more happy. And yep. it, yeah, it, going back to what you said before about how um, cultural preferences mediate sexual desire or mediate mating preferences, right? Like what's held up in the culture as something. And you could see Disney movies almost as reinforcing this back in the day. You know, you find the true love, you go through challenges, there are things that try to tempt you away and so on and so forth to see it as to simply call disney movies a <clears throat> patriarchal presupposition cis heteronormatively telling women about how they're supposed to stay under the boot of men you go a lot of what was happening with constraining sexual desire previously and having one man to one woman wasn't just constraining female sexual desire it was constraining male sexual desire as well it was making Absolutely. sure that men reached the threshold that they needed to in order to be worthy of having a woman. If a woman gives away sex too freely, men will meet that criteria. And if the criteria and the bar is set unbelievably low, men will do what's asked of them, which is not very much. And I, I accidentally clicked on his uh, thing there. But yeah, I think that's undeniably true, right? And when you look at, you know, Disney in the past, I mean, most Disney in the past, there was some original pieces made by Disney. But the majority of, like, past Disney... 
um, was largely just fairy tales, right? This is, you know, the common heritage, I guess you could call it, of Europeans that had been written over centuries or millennia, right? Um, you know, like the story of King Arthur, uh, Snow White, um, fucking Sleeping Beauty, Cinderella, um, all the different grim fairy tales. Um, you know, th this was like centuries and centuries, sometimes millennia of, you know, s stories that had, you know, lasted the test of time for different reasons. And nowadays, and you know, they were basically made relatively accurate, although usually d uh, kind of dumbed down a little bit because they tended to be a lot more violent and gory in like the traditional tellings of these stories. Um, but, you know, they, they gave both men and women something to strive for, right? If you look at them, there's obviously the, the, the hero's journey or the stereotypical, like, male hero's journey arc. Um, and then you've got, like, the – they have, like, female standards as well, right? Like, traditional female standards. And then when you see a lot of movies nowadays, right, a lot of the modern Disney and Pixar and DreamWorks and all these different companies, a lot of their stuff, um, you see what – would be considered like especially like in the 1950s would be considered like highly degenerative behavior right the normalization of you know f fucking these like messed up families where like you know th you've got like three half siblings and none of them have the same dad and fucking um you know the 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 girl is going on the hero's journey to become the most successful person ever and like all this stuff that is like very not good for society as a whole but like because we live in this kind of you know it's kind of funny we i i don't even know if like fairy tale is the right word because fairy tales tend to be like actually pretty uh you know based in reality but i know it's kind of the colloquialism but like we live in this kind of like fairy tale world now where reality doesn't matter and so much of it is about like how you feel and how you feel in the moment it's very hedonistic right it's not about like long-term success or long-term views of the world or uh, you know, what will, you know, giving up something now that way you have more later or like, you know, strategies and like how to live a successful life, right? It's all about like, you know, instant gratification and hedonism. Um, and I feel like, you know, there's been a big decline in Disney movies in, over the past years. And, and I, you know, I've, I had a debate, small debate. It was like three comments long, um, with somebody on one of my other videos and he was talking about like, I don't know if, uh, you know, it's, we're basically talking about like chicken and egg scenario, right? Is the decline of civilization because of the normalization of porn or is the normalization of porn because of the decline of civilization and i think it's a, it's because it's a feedback loop right when you have these things right you know civilization will start to decline you'll have the normalization of th certain things but then because those become normalized more people accept them which causes civilization to decline more which causes the normalization of more things, which causes civilization to decline more, which causes the normalization of more things, which causes more people to do them, which causes the, you know, and it's kind of like this negative feedback loop um, that'll probably continue, unfortunately, until we're, you know, taken over, right? Uh, it, it, like, look at the Roman Empire, right? The Roman Empire obviously had, like, this, you know, very hedonistic phase at the, like, when it was, like, at its, right after its height, when it started to decline, right? It became very, very hedonistic. Um, and then you had the rise of Christianity, which kind of stabilized it for a few years, but even then it eventually declined, right? Um, and then in the West, you had the Germanic warriors come and take over most of it. Uh, in the East, you had the Slavs come down and the uh, Arabs, you know, conquest the Turks, right? And basically, you know, the only reason that those civilizations were fixed and repaired and ended up becoming, you know, the Ottoman Empire and the different Muslim empires and, you know, <clears throat> the different... European empires of the, you know, medieval and early modern era is because they were conquered by these other peoples, right? The original people were not really in charge anymore. I mean, some of them were, right? Some of the, there was some cross marriage and shit, but they were conquered and new systems were put in place. And I think, unfortunately, that's probably what's going to happen to us. Um, and you're, you're kind of seeing it, right? We're almost being <coughs> conquered from within. You know, you can, uh, I mean, Erdogan, I think it was, was the Turkish guy. He's, he quite literally told the people in Turkey, just go to Germany, move to Germany, outbreed them, we'll take the country over in 40 years. And I, I think, I mean, it's a, it's a good strategy and it's probably beneficial for Germany because at the rate, you know, a lot of Western countries are going. I mean, you know, why even bother? Like, we're just fucking uh, wasting our own time and just waiting for nothing, but... Um, yeah, we kind of went all over the place with this one, but uh, like, comment, subscribe, let me know what you think below, and I'll see you in the next video.